What are the most important things that you need to know about lymphoma versus leukemia? And what is a good approach to understanding all of the different diagnoses and how we manage them? In this video, I'm gonna give you all of the high yield pearls that I've learned over the years, and hopefully make this a much more simple topic for you. One of the things that differentiates lymphoma versus leukemia is where you predominantly see the disease. So in lymphoma, it's kind of in the name, but you're gonna see it in the lymph nodes. And in general, we kind of consider it more solid. Whereas in leukemia, you're predominantly going to see it in the blood slash bone marrow. And we often consider it more of a kind of liquid. One of the analogies I've seen for this is that lymphoma is kind of like having lemons, whereas leukemia is like having lemonade. Now, just because you have one or the other does not mean that you can't switch back and forth between the two of them and that there's not a little bit of overlap here but predominantly lymphoma is gonna be in your lymph nodes, whereas leukemia is gonna be seen in your peripheral blood and in the bone marrow. The first branch point you wanna make with lymphoma is determining if this is Hodgkin's lymphoma or if this is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma has a better prognosis. Generally, you're going to see it start in a localized group of lymph nodes, and often it's kind of in the neck or cervical region, and we see what's called a contigu contiguous spread. So instead of seeing different lymph nodes in various different parts of the body, they're all kind of involved in the same area. And some other associations that you should know about it is its association with seeing Reen Sternberg cells. It has an association with EBV infection. And also there is a bimodal distribution. So you will see this in patients who are in their late teens and early 20s. And then later you'll see it maybe in their 50s or 60s. Some of the classic board type of associations that they like to test on are chest pain after drinking alcohol, and also um, pruritus after a hot shower. These are kind of buzzwords for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And just for your reference, one of the most common treatments for Hodgkin's lymphoma is ABVD. In contrast, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma tends to have a worse prognosis, and we are gonna see a non-contiguous spread. So you'll see some lymph nodes in the neck, and then in the groin, and then maybe in the axilla, and it's kind of all over. The branch points from here go to B cell lymphomas and T cell lymphomas. And what you really need to know is that the T cell lymphomas are extremely rare. So this is what you think of when you hear about those cutaneous ones like mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome. And then um, peripheral ones like uh, aggressive peripheral T cell lymphoma. But in general, where the money is at is going to be in the B cell lymphoma category. And then here we kind of have three categories as well. So you have your indolent lymphomas, you have your aggressive lymphomas, and then you have your very aggressive lymphomas. The indolent lymphomas include things like follicular lymphoma, as well as marginal zone lymphoma. Generally, these are considered not curable. And the reason is because they tend to be slow growing. And so they are not as responsive to cytotoxic chemotherapies. So what we tend to do instead of doing induction chemotherapy and just going very aggressive with these treatments, we tend to have a watch and wait strategy. On the aggressive side of things, you have diffuse large B cell lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma. And on the very aggressive side of things, we have lymphoblastic lymphoma, as well as Burkitt lymphoma. So these aggressive lymphomas are considered curable, but they require aggressive treatment as well. Some various points that you may want to know about these individual lymphomas. The most common one is going to be diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And actually one of the ways that we can get there is from transformation of follicular lymphoma to diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So generally we're just kind of watching and waiting, just doing supportive management. And then some amount of follicular lymphoma will transform into diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which has a poor prognosis. And then in both of these cases, the translocation uh, that's involved is the T14 to 18 translocation, which increases the expression of BCL2. Burkitt lymphoma is another high yield one to know about. So generally it's going to be seen in children more than adults. Generally we think about it when we see a rapidly uh, enlarging jaw or abdominal mass. And the doubling time of this can be very, very quick. Like within 24 hours, it can double in size. And so that's very characteristic of Burkitt lymphoma, which is very aggressive, obviously. And it does also have an EBV association, just like the Hodgkin's lymphoma we talked about earlier. And as well, the translocation is going to be T8 
to 14, which causes overexpression of the MYC uh, protein. Another buzzword that you should remember is something that you'll see on pathology, and that would be the starry sky appearance. In regards to treatment, uh, what you're going to see most of the time is going to be RCHOP, or even more uh, commonly now, you'll see something called dose-adjusted R-EPOC. So the dose-adjusted R-EPOC had better kind of outcomes, but it was a more aggressive regimen, but it is kind of the standard of care at this point. There are some new treatments that are coming out as well, but these are kind of the uh, first-line things that you're going to be seeing. One common question you may uh, get asked is, what do you need for diagnosis? And this is pretty important because they're going to ask you, what kind of biopsy do you need? And so in this case, an excisional biopsy is the gold standard. And so a fine needle aspiration is not sufficient. Uh, of course, there are some times where we do some um, core biopsies when excisional biopsy is not practical, but you always want to get an excisional biopsy to collect the uh, whole architecture of the lymph node and be able to get your diagnosis. Fine needle aspiration is just not sufficient. So this is a very important point. And then also uh, avoid steroids if possible. Uh, this is because steroids are often one of the treatments for lymphoma. And so if you give steroids before the biopsy, you might actually get rid of your lesion before you are able to actually nail a final diagnosis. In regards to staging, uh, all types of lymphoma use what's called the Ann Arbor staging system. And so most of these patients are going to need full body CT scans or PET CT scans to look for lymph node involvement. And what you need to really know is whether everything is on one side of the diaphragm or if it's on two, both sides of the diaphragm. So anything that is all just localized above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm is stage two or below. But if it's crossing both sides of the diaphragm, you're automatically at least stage three. So check if crosses diaphragm. All right, now let's move on to leukemia. And here we're gonna have kind of two major branch points. So the first one is going to be acute leukemia and the other one is going to be chronic leukemia. So some of the major differences you should know right off the bat is that acute is going to generally be sicker patients with a more rapid onset of presentation. And you're basically going to be looking for greater than 20% blasts in bone marrow or in the peripheral blood. You can also meet diagnostic criteria if you have uh, greater than 10% blasts with some uh, genetic criteria as well. And in these patients, treatment is needed as soon as possible. In contrast, the chronic leukemias are typically going to be a more insidious presentation, frequently just found when uh, people are obtaining routine CBCs and they're noted to have an extremely elevated white count. Instead of seeing blasts, you're going to see proliferation of mature cell types. For example, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, promyelocytes, instead of myeloblasts. And in these cases, uh, treatment tends to be less aggressive. So in the acute category, the main diagnoses you should be aware about are going to be ALL, or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and then AML, which is uh, acute myelogenous leukemia, and then finally a subset of AML, which is APML or APL, uh, acute promyelocytic leukemia. On the chronic side of things, we're going to have a CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, as well as CML, which are kind of your main players here. Uh, but actually, there is also an in-between stage that kind of has a more intermediate course, and that's CMML, chronic monomyelocytic leukemia. One of the things that can be helpful on board exams, but also in general when you're seeing these patients, is knowing the typical age ranges for these leukemias to present. So you can differentiate them sometimes based, just based on the age that they're presenting. ALL is the most common leukemia in children, but it can also be uh, in adults as well. And average age is around the 50s if it's in an adult. For AML, most patients are going to be presenting in their 60s, and patients with APML tend to present a little bit younger, for example, in their 50s. CLL patients, on the other hand, tend to be kind of the oldest group here, uh, typically presenting in their 70s. And then CMML and CML are also both in their 60s. So on your board exam, uh, if you see somebody who's in their 70s or 80s, most of the time it's going to be CLL. If it's somebody who is a teenager or a young person, it's often going to be ALL. And then AML, CML, these all kind of fall around in that more middle-aged uh, category. Just for reference, for some of the treatment regimens we use in these patients, uh, we use something called CalGB in uh, kids, 
and hyper CVAD in adults. Regimens for AML include 7 plus 3, HIDAC, and azacitidine venetoclex in patients who can't tolerate, um, you know, kind of stronger therapies. One other thing to note about uh, AML is that myelodysplastic syndrome is often seen in our older patients, you know, in their 70s, and it can often be a precursor to the development of AML. For APML, this is a very high yield one that gets tested a lot and also is one that really benefits from early and fast rec recognition because it has a high mortality if untreated, but it has a relatively better prognosis compared to APML. So basically some of the things that you can use to identify this, um, frequently it's gonna present with DIC. So if you ever see a patient with suspicion for leukemia and they have an elevated INR, they have blood, bleeding, clotting, then you should have a very high suspicion for APML. The translocation that's involved is a frequently tested one. It's the PML RARA gene, and uh, this is something that we can test for. And this is a T15 to 17 translocation. You may see hour rods on biopsy, and treatment includes all transretinoic acid uh, as well as arsenic. And it is very, very important that if you have any suspicion for APML, just giving all transretinoic acid is kind of the first thing that you start up front just in case they have APML because it helps improve the prognosis so much. For CLL, this is diagnosed when you see greater than 5,000 lymphocytes for at least three months as well as clonality on flow cytometry. You may see smudge cells on peripheral blood smear, and 5% of patients progress to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is also known as the Richter transformation, and this has a poor prognosis, but this is what the main fear is uh, in patients who have CLL, is this Richter transformation to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. There is an entity called uh, small lymphocytic leukemia, or SLL, and this is usually when it uh, predominates in the lymph nodes rather than in the peripheral blood. And treatment is generally a watch and wait strategy to see which patients will transform to DLBCL, but otherwise we kind of just monitor this and look for any clinical changes. CMML, like I talked about earlier, has this kind of intermediate course between CLL and CML. And for CML, you will often see very elevated white blood cells, and this is often how it's actually first detected. You should know about the Philadelphia chromosome and the BCR ABLE translocation, which is a T9 to 22 translocation. There are three kind of phases of CML. There's the chronic phase, the accelerated phase, and the blast phase. So most patients are in this chronic phase where we're just monitoring them, but eventually they may progress to this accelerated phase and blast phase which is when they may start to become more symptomatic. One thing that can be associated is a pretty significant basophilia after you get out of the chronic phase. And the treatment is with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So all of those nibs like ponatinib, imatinib, um, desatinib, things like that. All right, and then one additional thing that I wanna talk about is which patients are going to be at highest risk for developing signs of leukostasis. So leukostasis is when you have such a high white blood cell count that it starts to essentially clog all your blood vessels, leading to CNS symptoms, headaches, shortness of breath, visual disturbances, things like that. And so typically myeloid leukemias are going to have the highest risk for leukostasis. And the reason for this is that cells are considered really big and sticky um, compared to lymphoid uh, origin cells. So the myeloid uh, cells, once you're starting to see that white count get really high up there, like in the 100,000s, sometimes even before that, is when you're, you'd be more concerned for leukostasis compared to CLL, for example, where you may have a very high white count, but you don't have as big of a risk for leukostasis. All right, so I hope that was helpful in differentiating lymphoma versus leukemia and helping you understand the different diagnostic frameworks we use and also understanding the key associations and basic management strategies for these groups of conditions. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.